Ya segunda jornada de la Red Ecología Acústica México, esta es la segunda actividad, la segunda charla especializada, en este caso con eh, Jordan Lacey, un colega con quien hemos tenido la oportunidad de trabajar en varios proyectos y eh, hemos también co-curado algunas actividades académicas como en el ReSound, un track especial dedicado al sonido en, en agosto de este año en Alborg University, entre, entre otras muchas cosas. Um, a mí me corresponde eh, introducirlo y después eh, abrir un poco el diálogo con los que están aquí presentes. Su eh, eh, charla se titula Designing Urban Sonic Ecologies eh, y posteriormente haremos una pequeña visita aquí, Ada, aquí al patio interior donde tiene él su, una instalación sonora que se llama Fielding junto con Catherine Clover y tiene obra de varios artistas, de eso hablaremos en su momento. Entonces yo quisiera introducir a, a Jordan Lacey como eh, un uh, eh, creative practitioner, no necesariamente un artista, uh, que eh, se dedica a la transdisciplina también, es un investigador que está en RMIT, eh, RMIT University en Melbourne, en Australia, eh, originalmente eh, estudió música, es un artista sonoro también, pero se ha empezado a enfocar cada vez más en la creación de estos espacios de encuentro dentro de los, dentro de los entornos urbanos y que, bueno, entre otras muchas cosas. Es interesante que él acaba de recibir, este es su primer año, una beca de tres del Australian Research Council que la beca se titula Translating Ambience, Restorative Sound Design for Urban Soundscapes. Y bueno, gracias a esta beca es que él está aquí con nosotros y que está explorando esta parte de su eh, producción de investigación y creación. Um, es autor de Sonic Rupture, a Practice-Led Approach to Urban Soundscape Design, editado por Bloomsbury en 2016, que es este libro que tenemos aquí. Y bueno, yo eh, para efectos de mantener los tiempos le voy a dejar eh, la palabra a Jordan y eh, pues abriremos el diálogo. Esperemos que tengamos un poquito de tiempo para eh, preguntas y respuestas. Jordan. Thank you, Luz. And oh, here's my microphone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Luz. Um, it's very exciting to be here amongst colleagues and fellow artists and acoustic ecologists, etc. I uh, first met Luz in 2016 at the Sonologia conference where our conversation started, so it's great to have it continuing here now. We need to use the microphone. I need to just point that way. Is yeah. that what you're saying? No, more closer. Oh, okay. This is very awkward. Chair for a six-foot man. But <laughs> okay. The cable to my down. Cable went out? Yeah, the black one. Okay. Do you want to grab the mm -hmm. microphone with That's your it. hand? You want to grab okay. the microphone with your hand? Uh, can you hear me okay? and sound studies more broadly, the sonic rupture model. It's detailed in the book that uh, Lou's just held up. You're welcome to have a look at it at any point. I'm then going to talk about some industry-engaged research that applied the sonic rupture model, and then I'm going to talk about my present research agenda, translating ambience. Wait. Whoop. Okay. Sorry. There is a... Oh, there's a big window on my window. Uh, while Fernando is doing this, I should also thank Fernando and Jose at the back who have been helping me the last few weeks with the installation outside. They're amazing. Okay. May I continue? All right. So my practice as an artist and which uh, translates into my own artistic research, I'm a musician uh, with a focus on bass, guitar and electronics. I'm also a creative writer 
and now academic writer, I guess they can be the same thing sometimes. Uh, and I'm a public sound installation artist working in an urban design context, and that's primarily what this discussion's about. In terms of my own relationship with acoustic ecology, I'm a relatively latecomer um, compared to uh, Viv, Eric, Manuel, probably others in the room. I first came across it in 2008 as part of a soundscape studies course that was being taught at RMIT University. And for me, I grasped onto it because it brought together uh, three of my passions. It's environmentalism, music and education. And uh, I knew that I wanted to follow that passion when I discovered it. So where my research has led me is really thinking about how can acoustic ecology be applied in an urban context or a way that prioritises the urban experience. I think this is the, the, the challenge for acoustic ecology. And Schaefer, in his seminal 1977 book, Soundscape, gave us three ways of thinking about this, I think, that is still relevant today, 40 years later. Firstly, interdisciplinarity, which this conference emphasises so well with its coming together of arts, sciences and humanities. Schaefer was talking about that in his book, and this continues to be relevant. He also gave us the idea of soundscape design, that we could think of the sounds of the city as something that could be scaped, like a landscape, something that could be shaped into something new and different. And, of course, also there's the activism element of acoustic ecology. It is a type of activism. It is, um, you know, fighting for change in some capacity. But I turn to uh, Max Neuhaus as my inspiration for urban soundscape design. So it was very interesting, Manuel, to hear you talk about his approach to listening and listening walks. Because, of course, what he also did in 1977, at the same year that Schaefer released Soundscape, was put in his work uh, Times Square, uh, which is the first, probably, I think, was the first uh, example of a public installation artwork that's permanent and enduring. It's still going today. It had a brief hiatus, but it came back again. And Max Neuhaus's attitude to urban noise was, I think, more complex and interesting than the one that Schaefer gave us because he felt that, uh, well, he was quite critical in his day of the authorities who he felt were pushing a negative approach to noise. He talked about the Air Pollution Authority not being able to do their job, so they focused on noise because that was easier. And I think he felt that led to more of a dumb type of listening, if you like, rather than a nuanced listening or the sort of listening that Pauline Oliveras might talk about, for example, as we've referred to yesterday. And I think that's what enabled him to make a work like Times Square, because he was able to engage sensitively and intelligently with the noises in that area and design a work that gave a deep and uh, somewhat meaningful listening experience in that space. And I was there recently, and it's amazing. No one really knows it's there, but once you discover it, you go deep in terms of your experience of what otherwise would be considered a fairly noisy and unpleasant space. So I think Neuhaus uh, really needs to start coming forward in the discussion of urban soundscape design, because he gave us the first example of it, I, I think. In, whoop. in terms of practitioners working in the field today, um, those of you interested in acoustic ecology in an urban context may well want to take a photo of this slide. These are practitioners that are rethinking acoustic ecology, not to replace it, but to try to extend its reach into an urban capacity. So Gassia Azunian from Oxford University who teaches acoustic cities. Uh, Marcel Cabassen at Leiden University in the Netherlands who uh, inaugural professorial lecture called New Sonic Ecologies. My own work on sonic rupture which I'll present today. And Marie Holland who's a wonderful uh, soundscape designer and um, scholar from Aarhus in Denmark, The Overheard. And Jesse Budell from Adelaide, Australia, Featherstone's Sound Space. All of these Practitioners and scholars, I think, would claim some relationship to acoustic ecology, but are asking questions about how do we start to extend that thinking into the contemporary urban context. So I guess that's positioning myself in a community of practice. 
In terms of my own contribution to the field, it's firmly located with an urban soundscape design praxis, so the bringing together of scholarly research and artistic works. And what I've tried to do is reconfigure the lo-fi, hi-fi design tool, which is somewhat problematic. Uh, and I think Manuel in some way referred to that in his talk, but plenty of people have talk, talked to this, but with the sonic rupture model. So, my uh, PhD research, which was completed from 2011 to 2014, is pretty much summed up in chapter three of the book here. So I want to take you on that journey, if you like, of the artistic works that uh, led me to this claim that the sonic rupture model may be one of many possible uh, ways of interacting with the city. It doesn't just have to be the lo-fi, hi-fi tool, which also has its uh, merits. This is the uh, model, but I, I, uh, I'll come back to that at the end. The main thing I want you to take notice of on the your left is the subtraction, addition, transformation, passion and disclosure. And I'll, and I'll discuss what that means later. So it all started out with uh, 2010 Sites of Respite project. And I was working with my supervisor at the time, committed acoustic ecologist, committed to the lo-fi, hi-fi tool. And I spent some months really exploring all the laneways of Melbourne. Melbourne is my city and we're quite well known for our network of laneways, which are sort of small streets really without cars. I recorded in all these spaces my listening projects, my notes, and at the end I just became really frustrated and angry because I could not find a hi-fi soundscape anywhere. It seemed that it didn't exist, it wasn't possible. And I eventually came to think the only place you can find a hi-fi soundscape, well here's an example of the, um, in Helsinki, I think it's called the Silent Chapel. Uh, it's non-denominational non space for people to escape the noises of the city and experience silence. And it suddenly occurred to me, well, there's churches everywhere. You don't have to be religious to visit a church and enjoy silence. It's accessible. Uh, but in the context of outdoor spaces, it seemed to me there was no such thing as a hi-fi soundscape. And I thought, the problem here is me and how I'm listening. I'm listening negatively. I've got to start to listen in a more affirmative way to the city if I'm going to do anything useful. But before I did that, I did uh, confirm the lo-fi, hi-fi tool with one project called Subtraction. It was called Shutdown, which led to the Subtraction approach. And there was this lovely exhaust fan, which you're going to hear in a moment, in RMIT University, that extracted um, car fumes from an underground car park into this open public space where students would gather. And it was very loud. And so I organised with my students to shut it down. It took about three months to organise a half hour shutdown, which sounded like this. It's a pretty nasty sound, so brace yourself. You will hear the shutdown just as you can see it. So what really struck me about this experience was two things. Firstly, um, Barry Truax has a very nice metaphor about noises being like fog, that when you're in these noisy lo-fi environments, it's a bit like when you're standing in fog and you can't see in front of your eyes. Uh, and when you're in a hi-fi environment, it's like the fog is lifted and you can see with a greater distance. And acoustically, that's uh, what happened on this site. When, the, when it was shut down, you could hear for much greater distances, so the acoustic horizon was expanded. But also you can see these um, vertical lines of voice formants, so suddenly all these voices started appearing. And so it did feel like there was an effect happening in the space when it was shut down. However, it switched back on after half an hour and it never switched off again. 
and I realised I could go mad with a practice like this, spending my life trying to turn off noise. So I thought there's got to be a more interesting thing to do. So when I zoomed in on this image in the bottom part uh, of the left-hand side where the exhaust fan is still on, you can see these straight horizontal lines or broadband noise. And I was reading a lot of Deleuze at the time, which uh, I won't go into uh, for all our sanity in this moment. Uh, but the, I came up with this concept of the striated soundscape, which helped me artistically to move into the next phase of the research, which became about addition. Uh, Revoicing the striated soundscape was the name of this uh, project, which could be a whole other 45-minute presentation to discuss why I gave it that name, but I'm not going to do that now. Thank you, Liz. Uh, so I became very interested in these types of spaces. You can see uh, there's air conditioners everywhere. You know, so there was no escape, escape from uh, noise or lo-fi environments in outdoor spaces. So while my colleagues like Leah Barclay are busy recording whales and Doug Quinn's recording Waddell seals, etc., I'm recording air conditioners. So you know, maybe I could have taken a better path, but here I am recording air conditioners, taking notes on air conditioning sounds, when air conditioners turn on and turn off. So I came to perceive these sites as a sonic ecology uh, that should be given uh, equal status with any other ecology. That's how I came to feel about them as an artist. I took extensive notes um, on these spaces. Uh, I did a lot of field recordings and I came up with these um, if you like, a, a, a list of um, sound objects or an inventory of the sonic ecology. I then started to take these sounds and started to play with them to think how I might be able to transform them into something different. So I play with uh, image to sound programs like Metasynth, Ableton Live, a program uh, which I love. And also I started to think about how I could spatialise these sounds using this uh, bespoke program called WASP, created by Geoffrey Hannum, a colleague of mine at RMIT. Because one thing I noticed about these sounds is that they're, 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 they're stable, they don't move. So I thought, oh, maybe we can start to make them move around. Maybe that would create a more interesting environment. So then I had to think about how would I house these sounds in the urban environment. And it seemed very natural that they should be housed inside air conditioning units. And this is where the artist becomes the labourer. So I had to find my units. I then had to do a cut and paste job. I found eight air conditioners, collapsed them into four. I then had to find something to mount them on and integrate them into the laneway space. So you can see there, there's the uh, Bose speaker, which is fully weatherproof, and the speaker wiring passed through the conduits, which typically, typically hold the uh, speaker wire for an air conditioner. And this is what I came up with. Four air conditioners uh, in a quadraphonic array sitting inside a Melbourne laneway. This is where the, um, the mothership was, if you like, uh, the computer driving the system. And that man you can see in the background is a lovely air conditioning mechanic I met one day. And he took me on the roof so I could see all the air conditioners on the roof that were generating the noise in that space. So this is the sound that I wanted to somehow interact with, with my air conditioners. And this is what it sounded like, more or less. There were eight compositions. I think there was about two hours of sounds altogether. Uh, this is one of them called Rhythm. It's the most active one. You have to imagine these sounds skipping around inside the space and these people walking through where they would just typically hear the hrrrr of an air conditioner. They, they got to hear this instead.
Okay. So you can hear the birds chirping happily in the background. And you may argue, of course, that this is just adding another, adding another layer of noise on noise, and to some extent that's true. But it also provides an alternative listening experience in a space that would uh, otherwise just be another droning laneway. And I think that uh, the strongest relationship this work has in terms of precedence is Max Neuhaus's Times Square and what he was t trying to do, I think, if I do say so myself. Okay, so this led to the next work, uh, Subterranean Voices, which became the transformation approach. And this is where I was invited to do a work uh, beneath Federation Square, a very strange environment, uh, deep beneath the ground and aside a uh, railway platform. I spent uh, many weeks down in this space alone in the cold, uh, listening, very much applying the same uh, principle as the laneway, listening to the space, and this is the, the sounds that I could hear, the subtle drops of, uh, within these pipes, the passing trains, the PA announcements, train stop and take off, water gurgle, close passing trains, etc. This is a, a deep listening um, approach in terms of really tuning in and hearing what was there. And then I uh, captured this uh, group of sounds which I would use in the work. We made the space blue with the, the co co covering of the lights. It just felt, felt like the appropriate mood for this underground space. And mounted eight speakers throughout the, throughout the area. You can see them here in some of these photos. I used MIDI foot pedals and MIDI hand controllers to essentially play back the field recordings I'd taken in the space. So my idea was to try to merge the field recordings with the existing sounds to transform the perceptual experience in the space. So again, very much similar to the laneway approach. How can we transform the way people listen, interconnect with and imagine uh, the sounds of the city? Uh, this is the Ableton arrangement. This is the composition score, handwritten. And we'll just play uh, one moment uh, where it was just me and directly on the other side of that wall uh, was the Sandringham line and there was a train uh, parked there and there was a train driver just on the other side of the wall uh, to where I'm sitting. But of course the train driver doesn't know uh, I'm there and he hears these sounds and he responds to these sounds. So I'll just play that moment. These are all very familiar sounds to a Melbourne person. So, okay, um, <laughs> I must have really been talking a lot. Um, so I've lost my train of thought now. Um, uh, that was a good pun, I'll leave it there. 
Uh, oh, yeah. So I, I suppose what was important to me about these works is that it gave me a sense of how uh, noise, despite its frustrations and interruptions, could become a meditative experience through uh, sound art intervention. And I think that that's the type of uh, acoustic ecology uh, approach to noise design I was looking for in those moments. Just very quickly, I won't play on these, uh, but two other approaches that came through a work called Intimate Footsteps, uh, which led to the passion approach where you could sit in between two people rushing towards you and, and kissing uh, with great passion, as you can see by the smiles on the faces. And this other work, um, uh, Mediumistic, uh, which led to the disclosure approach in which I worked with an artist who invited um, mediums into uh, a, an old convent to talk with ghosts and we, we recorded those conversations and played them back. Anyway, that, that's a whole other story. So very quickly, the model here, essentially, uh, through these five artworks, it led to these five approaches. Uh, passion, disclosure, subtraction, addition, transformation. And in the book, I go on with another chapter that lists many artists and architects and designers who I think have produced works that these uh, five approaches can be framed in. And this model is now taught in... Uh, some universities, um, particularly the practitioners I talked about earlier, just as a way really for students to, uh, you know, to trigger alternative ways of, of responding to the, uh, to the urban uh, soundscape rather than that. So the lo-fi, hi-fi tool is there within the subtraction approach, but then there's many, many other ways of thinking about what uh, an urban space could be. All right, Luce tells me I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to be quick, but the second part really I want to talk about... Um, uh, in the conclusion of uh, Sonic Rupture, uh, I talked about um, uh, the ways that the sound artist and uh, soundscape designer uh, might actually start to uh, create these changes in an urban context. What's possible? So, so I, I won a VC uh, postdoctoral fellowship from my university to explore this idea. And uh, on page 178, I suppose it's not really to core and to quote yourself, but anyway... Here I go. Uh, creation of sites that afford possibilities for cre cre uh, collective acts of, e of, of creative expression. So uh, really the idea is how does the sound artist not just operate in a gallery environment or some sort of prestigious academic environment, but how can the sound artist act in an everyday context working with industry? Uh, and also um, uh, working with uh, councils and government to create new listening experiences. So that's what we wanted to set out and do with this one. So in this one we work with a, a burrow to the southeast of, of Melbourne and we essentially uh, uh, dug a big hole in the ground next to a community centre that was being built. And in this hole we put in a carved piece of basalt or bluestone and in this bluestone there's four aluminium strips inlaid uh, and essentially what it does is it turns it into like a giant touchstone which is the name of the work uh, and uh, when you touch this stone it sends uh, an electrical signal through the box that you can see on the right uh, and it causes two metal plates which were um, installed either side of the touchstone to vibrate. Yeah? So it references this idea of the power of the land or the spirit of the land. Uh, so when you stand on these metal plates, you touch the stone, you, your body vibrates, but also these two speakers that you can see uh, at the bottom uh, would play sympathetic um, uh, frequencies uh, for the ear. So there were sounds for the body, sounds for the ear. And this was the mothership inside with the, the genius digital designer, Zhuang uh, Ku. Um, and this is its first moment, a rather shamanic shot, I like to think. Um, and I'll play you a quick uh, rendition of how it, how it sounds um, in the morning at dawn. Because what this stone does is every dawn and every dusk, we wanted to try and create... Uh, a sound mark, if you like, as, as Murray Schaefer talks about, like a sound that is, is special for a local community. And so when this stone is touched, it develops a memory and it creates its own composition uh, in the, in, at dawn or at dusk, um, depending on how much it's been played with and touched by the community. So this was the first time it, it, it produced a song. Yeah. 
So the the sounds, all the uh, nature sounds you can hear are from a nearby wetland that we imported into this space. And there's a, a, a lullaby, which is a bit back to front, but anyway, being sung by uh, a, an Indian lady who was a friend of one of the sound, uh, sound artists involved. So that's the community centre that the artwork was integrated into. So this is the idea of uh, artists and designers being asked at the beginning of a building process to be part of that process and this is the possibilities of what, what can come out. Rather than just another functional space, there's an interactive artistic space. It's also uh, vandal proof, it's a stone and, and metal, so uh, pretty, pretty difficult to destroy so far. <laughs> Okay, uh, my second example is uh, noise transformation. So on page 179, I set myself this, um, this goal, if you like. How can we network creative encounters across the urban? Uh, this requires working with functional agents, and by functional agents, I mean those agencies who are responsible for the creation of infrastructure, whether they be buildings or roads or utilities, etc. To ensure the imaginative becomes as essential to the urban as its normal expressions. So in this case, uh, I uh, walked alongside these motorways in Melbourne. Um, I'm sure you have them here too. I, I think they're everywhere. And, uh, and of course, what, what is interesting about these motorways is that they have these noise walls and they're designed to reduce the, the traffic noise by about six decibels, which they do very effectively. They, they halve, the loud, halve the loudness level. Uh, but they still have residual noise, which creates fairly uncomfortable environments. Uh, and those environments tend, tend to be left uh, isolated, unused and overgrown, as you can see from some of these images. Um, although some of them, there's parklands, small patches of grasslands that aren't really used. So I started to think, how could we start to design these soundscapes into something that people would want to visit? So again, familiar theme, listening, field recording, note taking. And we got to work with the wonderful Stefan Moore, who some of, you, some of you will know, a sound designer from Chicago who famously worked with Merce Cunningham. He came and joined us and we worked in a laboratory to do two things. We worked with an engineer uh, who was trying to cancel noise. That doesn't really work unless you've got noise cancelling headphones on, that's another story. But we also work with Stefan to design uh, these transformations. So the idea is you would take a live feed of the noise, pass it through a computer-based algorithm, and then you would play back out into the environment transformations of the existing noises. So we tested it in this uh, laboratory situation first, came up with a few um, uh, transformations we thought were the most effective. And then we uh, created a sort of a showcase in one of these uh, environments uh, in Melbourne uh, and invited a lot of industry agen agencies down to experience this. We also did the same thing in Sydney. Uh, you can see here the arrangement. So there were four speakers, a uh, quadraphonic array. We sat people in the middle. And uh, this I love because what you actually see here are the executives of Transurban and Macquarie Bank who would be two of the biggest money-making organisations in Australia. And here they are sitting in, you know, a fairly uh, run-down environment, uh, intrigued by what they were hearing. And so I'll play a bit of that. Uh, it starts off with uh, natural traffic sound, if you like. And then I think there's three uh, transformations, play one after the other.
So playing back field recordings of an installation is like taking, taking photos of a painting, right? I mean, you can't really capture what it's like in the actual experience. But uh, the main things to point out about this is that these are meant to be highly localised so that they wouldn't become invasive in terms of um, going into other people's houses. It's really like a first stage of design. So if we can make the soundscape something more pleasant, uh, uh, to be inside of, and that was certainly the response we got from the ethnographers we worked with. Um, people did claim that it made them feel less anxious or more likely to be in the space, but that's only after three days. You'd need, you'd need it to go for months to know for sure. But what's important is that we had these executives sitting down listening and taking seriously the notion uh, of, of a sound environment as being critical uh, to people's health and well-being in the city. So just very quickly, a bridging project to the third part of my talk. Um, it's relevant to what we're going to see outside. It was called Fielding. Um, it's so great to have Viv here, who is actually one of the contributing artists to this work. Uh, and uh, I work with uh, Catherine Clover, who some of you will know, who's a wonderful sound artist. Um, based in Melbourne and uh, what we did with fielding is we I'm going to tell you that later I just wanted you to see that image really so I can relate to it later all right so please take a mental uh, note of this image so this brings me to uh, the third part of my talk and I'm going to get a little bit theoretical here so uh, bear with me uh, it does finish with a, with a uh, playing back a work, which is the last work in, in, the, in the series of this talk. So this has been funded by the Australian Research Council uh, DECRA Fellowship, which is a fairly prestigious grant in Australia, and they're pretty, pretty rare for artists and designers to get it, so I'm making the most of it, and it's what's brought me here uh, to, to present here um, at this conference. Uh, it's titled Translating Ambience, Restorative sound design for urban soundscapes, and the ambience term. Uh, I directly, uh, purposely use that spelling, because it comes from Jean Paul de uh, uh work with um, ambience theory, which is similar to the atmosphere theory put forward by Gerno Burma. Uh, it's coming from an architectural perspective, and it's getting us to think about how sounds, and more generally, uh, our senses, uh, enable us to um, um, to create alternative uh, relationships with environments. So rather than just thinking about it as structures or objects, we think about it through perception. So if we look at the world collectively, including plants, animals, a landscape, and other features and products of the earth, as opposed to humans or human creations, and a definition of the urban would be in relating to or characteristic of a town or city or the built environment, so we talk about urban and nature, those terms meet, mean something, but they're also problematic because of course in the urban we also have a physical world, we have plants and animals and landscape, and we have features and products of the earth. I mean everything is built from features and products of the earth. And equally in nature we have roads, we have utilities uh, that are familiar to an urban environment. We also have in both spaces uh, air, sunlight and sound, etc. So what I'm trying to build on here with translating ambience is that if we can start to understand an environment through its ambience, can we start to think about how we can translate um, the perceptual experiences of nature into an urban environment and what would that mean? So to do this, to look, we can start to look at coding as a design approach. And when I say coding, I'm very much thinking about the work of Nicolas Boriard, the um, arts critic who wrote uh, Relational Aesthetics. And uh, he also wrote a book called The Radicant. And in this, he talks about the work as the artist as being translating across codes. And he's, um, you know, simple example of that, if you like, is the development of Creole as being, as growing out of two different languages coming together. It creates something new and leaves something behind. So if we think about it like this, we can say there is a nature in urban, but only in so far as we humans have created and applied such systemic understandings of the land. Which leads me to questions, does the land or our other fellow animals that we live with, do they differentiate between the urban and nature or is it just us? And we can think of nature as being mythic, but 
if we think like this, can we not also think of the urban as being something mythic and expressive? So to define ambience and translation as a means to justify to bring the term, two terms together, ambience is the way that we understand space through our perceptibility of the world, those feelings that emerge through central engagement with the ambient expressions, sound, light, etc., of an environment. That comes from Jean-Paul Thibault. And equally, um, translation, we can think of as the creative processes that work across codes, leaving an irreducible remainder while creating something new. And as I said, think of Creole. So what that means is that when we translate across codes, by, pro by that process we're creating something new, something different, but we're not trying to recreate the environments that we're working with. So the ambition of my research is to start to think, and this comes from the philosopher Henry Lefebvre, who talked about a second nature or, or new nature. By translating ambience from a natural space into an urban space, what new environments might emerge? Uh, so a new nature is not replacing the urban with nature, such as biophilic approaches for those who know of biophilia. That is, you know, planting trees and bringing nature into the urban but it seeks new urban environments that create effects equivalent in, a, in intensity to nature. So that, that is the, the ambition of the research. So, as an example, uh, I just uh, curated an exhibition in Melbourne called Translating Ambience, and I still have some catalogues and please, um, it would be great to see all these go because they're left over and I have more. Um, but uh, there's uh, essays in here by Jean-Paul Thibault, uh, also the uh, well-known ethno ethnographic scholar Sarah Pink, uh, sound artist Philip Samatsis, and a statement by myself and a statement from all the artists involved in the work. So uh, uh, please come and grab one. And my work in this um, exhibition was called Cold, and I'm going to talk about that in the Sound and Immersivity Conference on Friday, so I won't say too much because I imagine many of you will be there. Is that, is that right? Yeah, right. I thought there'd be two different audiences, and so I realise I'm possibly going to repeat myself on Friday, but anyway, I'll worry about that then. They're different audiences. Okay, good. So this is uh, uh, me in the Alpines, uh, which are mountains in Victoria. Um, collecting sounds. I was there as part of the Bogong Masterclass run by Douglas Quinn and Philip Samatsis, who were two acoustic ecologists working in very different domains approaches. Um, so I, I learned a lot from being with them. And uh, this area here uh, was like a natural clearing, like a linear clearing, and there was a river running under the, under the ground. Uh, so uh, I have the microphone there that's taking a ambisonic recording and I also have with me hydrophones. And what I discover are all these little nooks in the ground. And so I drop the hydrophones in to record these uh, nooks, if you like, which I'll talk about in more detail on Friday. That's just the recording system. I also noticed uh, in, the, in, in these areas, I became very uh, interested in the snow and, and the beautiful way that the snow would reflect, refract the light. These are my field notes in situ. So on the left, you can see the setup, which is an ambisonic mic and four hydrophones. One of them was a dolphin ear, that's the circle. And also you can see those crosses uh, where the four nooks were, or the holes in the ground where I could access the river. And I'll show you that image because, um, ah. And this is my image of the laneway where this ambience was to be translated. You can see there those four rectangles the air conditioners are back. So they climb down the walls, they find themselves in the... So just to see the arrangement of the nooks and the arrangement of the air conditioners. So there's a spatial translation. Uh, now, I better be careful here because this may boom. So in this time in the air conditioners, we put uh, LED lights that... Uh, was synchronised to the hydrophone sounds. So we're trying to create that impression of the refraction of the snow and also the way that light reflects off the surface of water. 
quite hypnotic. And of course, as each of the four nooks had its own hydrophonic recording, the lighting patterns for each uh, air conditioner were, were different. And this was more or less what it sounded and, and looked like. So, so as Lou said at the start, there, there is this idea of creating meeting points or small micro-environments. Um, and Richard brought up the question yesterday about megacities and how might acoustic ecology design for megacities um, or megalopolises. Uh, this is, is, is my response. This sort of thing, this sort of thing out here. Um, you know, so you can imagine, well, obviously, cities like Mexico City or Hong Kong, New York, Mumbai, soon Sydney, we're getting there. Once we have these populations that exceed 20, 30, maybe 40 million, and if people can't get access to nature, how can we start to design these small uh, microenvironments that could act as new natures in terms of the effects that they produce uh, for, for people who visit those spots? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Eh, nos pusimos de acuerdo en un momento, Jordan y yo, pensando en que vamos a hacer la, la visita guiada, que tenemos media hora para hablar de su pieza, y que quizás ahí es donde podamos plantear el diálogo que hubiéramos tenido aquí eh, si hubiéramos cortado hace 15 minutos. Entonces creo que va a empatar bien eh, esta situación y nos permitió escuchar las tres partes de la presentación de, de Jordan Lacey, que justamente una de las razones cuando eh, empezamos a, a trabajar juntos, por así decirlo, por lo menos a conocer el trabajo eh, mutuo, eh, en, en efecto en sonología, allá en Brasil, él acababa de publicar este libro y una de las cosas que me interesó mucho es, es este esta parte de, de, de buscar una aproximación crítica a eh, toda la teoría y los estudios y la creación que se hace en torno al sonido y el espacio y que creo que eh, es algo que también tenemos que, que incorporar porque son nuevas generaciones, ya lo decía Manuel en la mañana, eh, no, el sonido de los aviones, el sonido de, de las calles, eh, eso también forma parte de nuestros paisajes urbanos y... Eh, pues John Reback también estaba haciendo un estudio acerca de las máquinas para secarte las manos en los, en los baños, que muchas veces mm. producen hasta sordera en los niños pequeños, ¿no? y que quizás no estamos, eh, estamos mirando hacia allá los especialistas en este tipo de temas. Y bueno, en mi caso, estos sonidos siempre pues, se han incorporado a mis producciones de, de arte, pero sí, en efecto, no es, no es lo necesariamente lo habitual o lo más, lo, lo más cercano a lo que podamos encontrar. Entonces, eh, yo quisiera agradecer nuevamente a Jordan que esté aquí con nosotros, que haya aceptado esta invitación para estas primeras jornadas de la REA. Yo creo que, que tener la, la oportunidad de, de escuchar a académicos de distintas generaciones con distintos acercamientos al tema es fundamental, eh, porque también entre los, entre los miembros venimos de todos los ámbitos ¿no? de, la, de la ciencia y de la creación, entonces creo que, que justamente este tipo de aproximaciones son muy enriquecedoras para nuestros posibles diálogos de mañana, por ejemplo. ¿no? Entonces yo eh, quisiera, thank you again, thank I, you. I really appreciate the effort and, and also um, the fact that you put together that, that uh, sound installation el hecho de que haya, haya aceptado también participar con una obra para, para tener un acercamiento al, al trabajo también de otros artistas. Y eh, los invito entonces, cerramos este, en este momento la charla especializada con Jordan Lacey y, y pasamos al, al patio interior y ahí podemos establecer el diálogo, las preguntas que pudieran tener y que nos hable ya más en concreto uh, sobre su, su instalación que tenemos aquí afuera. Pues muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.